Praise God. Wow. Thank you guys for serving so faithfully and practicing hard and making making God's heart happy with your worship. I uh, Hi, my name is Conrad Carroll. I am the youth director here at ARCF and my first privilege today is to dismiss all of the kids over with Mr. Carl. Um, we have not all of them. <laughs> if you... <laughs> we have some awesome Bible teachers who are going to make that education super fun and engaging and awesome. So thank you guys. Um, yeah, so I have the privilege of being the youth director here and uh, these students, um, two of them are my cousins, but I'm not biased. I really love all of them. Um, but um, yeah, it's, I've been, it's been four and a half years that I've been youth, the, the youth pastor, the youth director, and uh, to see the growth in students who like, we're not just teaching them how to um, play instruments and we're not just teaching them how to sing. Um, but they, they are really, they're really learning like in their hearts how to worship God. And it's, it's just beautiful and I'm really excited about it. Um, so thank you guys. Thank you. Um, today we are going to, um, continue our, our series through the, the Lord's prayer. And today we are at, give us this day, our daily bread. And, um, well, I, I want to start for all of you, you who have like cool liturgical backgrounds, uh, we're all going to stand together and recite uh, the Lord's prayer. And don't worry, we don't have to read different translations in your Bible. I got it up on the screen. So if you would all stand and we will, uh, we'll recite this together. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God, we thank you for what you are doing inside of us, Lord. I, I just pray that your word would, would speak to each heart here today. God, I thank you. I ask that you would use me as that vessel, but God, I know that it's your Holy Spirit that's doing the work. God, would you just flood this place? Like, you, you already are here, Lord, but in each heart, would you be working? Would you be softening so that your word can, can reign supreme? We love you, Lord, and we pray this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You guys can sit down. Um, The five things you need in order to live well. I googled this, so you know that it's real. Um, this was an article from a psychologist, psychology person uh, named Melissa Chu. I'd never heard of her either, don't worry. Um, but uh, in this article, she lists these five things. Air, food, movement, sleep, and purpose. So air, you need to sit up straight, breathe in deep. Like, whew, that's just a natural part. Some of us don't even do that good. Food, like just make sure you're eating the good things. Like you don't have to go organic, but there's so many processed things. Just like eat the good stuff. Movement, like your body is happy when you move. Like this is something that helps you like have that drive. Uh, sleep. So many of us are so focused on work that sleep is like secondary. So we need to get seven to nine. Like you, you need it. Um, and then purpose. If you don't have a reason to get up in the morning, then like you, you, you need that. That's part of what you need in order to live well. Another cool set of psychological thing, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Anyone ever seen this pyramid before? Anyone take psychology class? All right, a few of you, that's cool. Um, so Maslow's theory is that none of these can be met and like it starts at the bottom. If the bottom one's not met, none of the one, none of the ones above it can be met. So it starts with physiological needs, like we were talking about air, water, food, those important things that you have to have. And then next, Safety needs, like do I have a secure location? Do, like for us, a lot of it's financial stability, um, you know, these kind of things, health, property. Uh, then next, family, friends, these loving relationships. It's so important. 
Uh, and then next, now we're looking inward, my esteem. Like, how do I feel about myself? Do I have a good reputation? And then finally, self-actualization, desire to become the most that one can be. A hey, warning. This is just like, beware. Um, you could hear this message today and think that I am preaching one of those messages. Um, you could think that I'm preaching Maslow's message or Melissa Chu's message, but stick with me because this is the Word of God, um, and it's for, it's for you today. Um, and so we're zeroing in. We're, we're in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, and we're zeroing in on the phrase, Give us today our daily bread. Now this is really important. When Jesus says this, he's not like mincing his words. He's not guessing about what he's saying. And the people who are, are hearing him, they know absolutely without a doubt what he is saying, what he intends. But for us, some of us are kind of on the outside because it's a cultural and historical thing that he's saying. It would be like for us Americans, if you were uh, going to be sitting having an imaginary tea party with like a little, you know, some little girls and, and then they start to get into a fight and they start throwing things and you're like, whoa, I didn't realize this was a Boston tea party. Like, all, all of us would get it because there's something so core about the Boston Tea Party. You know, before we were even a formal nation, we were just a colony. Like, we, over th we were, like, throwing all of the tea over the edge to say, yeah, your tax sucks, England. Thanks a bunch. You know, so there's, there's this revolt. There's this revolution. It's core. There's something deeper. We understand that. Um, and this daily bread thing is exactly that. Something, something so core to Israel's history um, that everyone knows it. Everyone hears it. In fact, um, for, for, for the men in Israel's culture, Hebrew boys, as, as they're growing up, until they become a man when they're like 13, uh, they have to memorize the first five books of the Bible. Um, they call it the Torah, or we call it the Pentateuch sometimes, but Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they had to memorize those. Anyone memorize the book of the Bible? Yeah, I don't know. It's like, that's just like different culture. We're, we're not there. We have phones that rem remember it for us. Um, but so they had, to, they had to memorize it. So this is something that like everyone knows. It's just there. It's just common. Um, and the story, when, when Jesus says, um, when he says daily bread, as soon as he mentions daily bread, everyone immediately thinks of manna. And manna, if you're, not, if you're not familiar with scripture, if you're kind of new to church, manna just sounds like a made-up word. And you're right, it is. It's just a made-up word. Um, this is, this is a, a, a historical moment where God provides miraculous bread from heaven for the nation of Israel, um, which is such a cool thing. Um, and he, just does, he doesn't just do it one time. He does it every day. Um, so when, when Jesus says daily bread, everyone's like, oh, the bread that showed up every day. Of course, yeah, the daily bread. So let me set the stage for you a little bit. Um, this is a pretty common story, but, but most of you will know it, but, but here we go. We're, we're in Egypt. Israel used to have this cool working relationship with Egypt, and then all of a sudden they became so numerous that the new pharaoh was like, you know what, if we went to war, they could beat us because they have so many people. So then all of a sudden they... They like, started to treat them harshly and made them into slaves until now the entire nation of Israel is just Egypt's slaves. Um, you know, cool like little pharaoh movies, what's a prince of Egypt, or you know, like, you, you know, it's great, it's great, good stories. But um, then God calls a man and his, a stubborn man and his uh, loudmouth brother to free Israel from Egypt's grasp. And so God looks at him and says, go free my people. And Moses is like, no. And God's like, yes. Moses is like, no. <laughs> God's like, you don't get it. I'm God. You don't <laughs> like, you listen to me. Um, and so then he leads them out of Egypt. God uses Moses to lead them out of Egypt, uh, finally makes through a lot of difficulty, ten plagues makes Mo, uh, makes Pharaoh see that he needs to free Israel, and they're fleeing, and then they get stuck at the Red Sea. They're like everything's going great, and then all of a sudden, now they have this giant barrier of a giant water, a body of water. And then Pharaoh changes his mind. He's like, you know what? I just let all of our wage-free labor go, 
I want them back, actually. And so then he starts to chase after them, and the Israelites see the Egyptians chasing after them, and he's like, oh, thanks, Moses. Did you just bring, it out, bring us out here to die because there weren't enough graves in Egypt? You had to bury us here by the sea? Thanks. Thanks a bunch. And then, uh, and then Moses says something that he hears from the Lord, Exodus 14, 14. I love this verse. It says, the Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. And, and then, of course, he does. He parts the Red Sea. And all of Israel walks through on dry land, through the Red Sea. Uh, and Pharaoh is like, huh, God's providing an escape. I'll use that exact same escape to go chase after them, which like, doesn't make a whole ton of sense. Because then, of course, God collapses the water onto Pharaoh and all of his men. And they die at the bottom of the Red Sea. And... Israel is free, and they celebrate, and they praise God. And then a chapter later, they complain and are like, oh my gosh, I wish we were back in Egypt, because I am starving, at least back in Egypt. Yeah, we were slaves, but we ate good food, and now we're out here just to die. Again, thanks Moses, here we are dying. And, and so there's like this bitterness, this like resentment, and God, to those people, to those bitter, undeserving people, he, he provides. He, he says, behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you. Um, which, if we just pause and take a moment, and like, if you were telling your friends, hey, uh, tomorrow God is going to like rain down bread from heaven, and we need to go and collect it and eat it. Um, that would just sound wrong on like so many levels. Like, first of all, no, that's impossible. Also, it was on the ground, and you want me to eat it? Like, five second rule much? Come on. Like, it's not, it's not going to go over well. But, this, this miracle provision wasn't just one time. It would be miraculous if it was just one time, but it was every day. It was every day for 40 years, God provided this, this manna that manifested like, a, it was like the dew came up on the grass, and then when it dried, it turned into this like flaky little like wafer thingy. They say it, it's like coriander seed. It's like honey. It tasted like honey in a wafer, like frosted flakes or something. I don't know, but... But every morning there was manna for them to eat, and then every evening, not only that, but then there was quail. Like birds just flew in and boom, like arrived at their doorstep dead. I don't know like how excited I would be. Like I would get scared. I don't know if that would be appetizing to me, you know? But, um, but it's, this is before there were kosher food laws in, st like, uh, in place, but, but still, I think I don't know how it would appear to make it like delectable that I would actually want to eat that, but but it was every day and they were provided for bread in the morning, meat at night. And then there were also really specific rules about, uh, it, it was strict that you provided as much as you needed for that day, nothing more. Uh, because if you kept any of the manna or any of the quail overnight into the next morning, it would spoil and it would grow worms and it would rot. And, uh, except for on the Sabbath, because on the Sabbath, God was instructing them, don't work on that day. So on the day before the Sabbath, they were able to gather as much as they would need for two days. And then somehow overnight, it wouldn't spoil that day, but any other day it would spoil. And it's just like, how, do, how does that work? I don't, I don't get that. This is miraculous. And this is something that God put in place for 40 years, that this just happened. This is just how life went. That a whole like drove of birds would like fly and then just like keel over and, and be like, all right, you can eat me now, you know? I, the fact that that would happen like this often, it's just crazy to me. So this is a miracle. And as soon as Jesus says daily bread, all of this story is just like, boom, right into the, right into, um, the Hebrew people's minds. And that's exactly who Jesus is talking to. It's a bunch of Israelites, a bunch of Hebrews. And so as soon as he says that, they're like, oh, the manna from heaven, the miracle daily bread. That's what he means when he says daily bread. It's, it's not even a question, not even close. They, they know exactly what it is. Um, for your information, we have a library right over there. And I found in it this week a Matthew Henry commentary, like, oh, it was so cool. And, and I, I didn't know it was in there. I just turned to it this week, and, and I was turning to this verse, and uh, he... Man, he broke it down so good that I was like, I'm just going to steal this. So uh, this message is courtesy of Matthew Henry and a really, really old commentary. 
Uh, but he says that every word in this verse has a message of its own. So I figure every message is about like 40 minutes. So we'll be here um, with those six words for the next three hours. So three o'clock, we'll be um, just about ready. Uh, so call off your lunch plans. We'll go more of like an early dinner sort of thing. So everyone on board? No, I'm just kidding. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll be a little, a little bit quicker <laughs> than that. But so let's start with the first word, bread. The food that is needful for me. I, I love this so much because this, this phrase right here is not in the Lord's Prayer, but it's actually in Proverbs. And I have it bookmarked. Yes, I do. It's in Proverbs chapter 30. And most of Proverbs uh, is very like, you know, you got one little verse and that little verse is a saying of its own. But towards the end, it starts to have like longer chunks where they start to tell a little bit more of a story as they, as they go along. And that's sort of like chapter 30, um, lead, like from verses 1 through 9 are so very tied together. And it starts out with this guy saying, Lord, I am worthless. I am weary. I am tired. I am stupid. I am, I am so stupid that I'm not even sure that I'm a human being. Like, how could I function as a person? I am so dumb. But you are holy, and you come down from heaven, and you provide. Um, and then he says this in a little bit of Hebrew poetry, verses, chapter 30, verses 7 through 9. He says, Two things I ask of you, deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehoods and lying, and give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of God. He says, give me the food that is needful for me. Very clear, don't give me too much. Because I might get all high and mighty and think I've got this stuff figured out. And I might say, I don't need you, God. He says, don't give me too much. How many times have you prayed that in your life? <laughs> and then he says, don't give me too little unless that I think that I have to do whatever it takes to make ends meet to be able to feed my family. Like, please don't give me too little, God, because I want to follow your commands. I want to love people. I don't want to steal. Please give me enough so that I just don't have to steal. Give me what is needful for me. Exactly what I need. Just like with the manna, it comes down that day. Like, give me, take as much as you need for that day. Then the next word we're going to look at is our bread. Give us our bread. Not what was intended for someone else. Give me what was intended for me, Lord. There's a sneaky little command in the Ten Commandments that says, Thou shall not covet. You shouldn't desire what your neighbor has. <sighs> And this is a tough one because a lot of people have really cool stuff that I don't have. Um, I, I work at a community center in Citrus Heights on Sayonara. And we were just talking about dreams and aspirations the other day. And even that's tough. When someone else has this cool thing that they want to do with their life, it's like, oh, man. Like, I wish I was going to do that cool thing with my life. Um, and, and sometimes it's like, oh, well, they've got it all well off. Like, they, they've got all the money they need. Like, the, of course they're going to have what they need. I wish I had that, and then I could be taken care of. It's like, no, you, that wasn't the life that, like, there is, there is something for you. Ask for what you need, not what someone else's need. Uh, so what someone else needs. So I want to ask for what was intended for me, not for someone else. But it says our, like what was intended for us. Like, let, let us get what we need and not what someone else's need. And this is interesting too, because like, especially, I feel like it's been very popular recently that like, people even have different like, dietary needs. That if I ate someone else's food, it might give me uh, indigestion. But like, for someone else, like, this food is exactly what they need. Um, and, and so like, th there are some people that if you have manna, like, man, I'm gluten intolerant. I can't be having that manna. Like, are you kidding me? But, you know, it's, it's, th there are certain things for each people. And if I ask for what someone else wants, I might, I might end up with, with something. Or if I ask for what someone else needs, I might end up with something I don't want. And then the next, our daily bread. God's provision will sustain us through each day. So the Lord's Prayer is in Matthew chapter 6. And if you just like maybe turn over the next page or look a little bit further down in verses 25 through 34. There's this cool like 
poem story thing that Jesus shares where, where he says, don't be anxious about your life. What you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, don't worry about that. He's like, look at the birds. They've got everything they need. Look at the flowers. They look great. This one is grass and is going to burn away. That one's a bird that's not going to live nearly as long as you. Don't you think that God cares about you a little bit more than the bird and the grass? And he ends off with, in verse 34, he says, Therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. God's provision right now is going to take care of me. And, and trusting that is really tough. I have, a, I have kind of a mindset where I would like to pay as much as I can for something, like in payments. Um, and so my phone coverage is a weird, like, little subcontracted, it's called Mint Mobile, and you pay for everything year, uh, at the beginning of the year. It's like, it's like cell coverage in bulk. And so I, uh, I, you know, I pay for, all, for, it, for the entire year, and then I never have to pay a bill until, like, next January. Like, oh, it's awesome. It's so great. My, my relationship with my phone provider is a once-a-year conversation. Not even a conversation, it's just online. I just click, click, click. All right, we're set. Like, that's all that it takes for me to interact with my phone provider. God is not my phone provider. If I... I don't want to interact with him once a year. I, I want to interact with him every day. Like, his provision, it, it's, it's an everyday thing. It's an everyday thing. But next, the word is give. Give. Begging God to be the giver. Because if he's the giver, then I'm the receiver. And, and that, that's like, that's my position in this life. I, I was thinking about the word give, and, and initially I was like, oh yeah, because when we say give, we're acknowledging that it's, that it's a gift. And that it's something that I don't deserve, and it's something that was given out of the generosity of someone else's spirit. So this is God being generous. But then I was also thinking, well, people give, like, your wages. They give you your wages, and you've earned that. But even then, even then, if you have worked to earn a certain wage, honestly, yeah, there are some laws about it and stuff, but the employer is still in charge, and... Like, it would be illegal, but they could withhold your wages from you. They are in charge of that. They are the one who has the wealth to distribute. They have it, not you. And, and so when someone is in the position to give, it is instantly saying, like, I am only in the position to receive. That is all that I can do. So begging God to be the giver is simply like, look, I'm not in charge. Because if we don't, if we don't say... If we don't ask God, if we don't plea with him, beg him to be the giver, then we're saying, God, I deserve my bread. You do not understand, Lord. I have worked. I am exhausted, and I deserve it. And, like, just be careful what you say, <laughs> because if you think that you are in charge, that might be a little bit of a backwards perspective. Just be aware of that. Next is us. Give us, not just me, but the people around me, too. This is, this is a position that helps to teach us compassion. That, yes, I have needs, but just so, so does every single person in this room. Every single one of us have nearly the same needs, but, but even then, no, they're different. They're different. Lord, would you give us? Would you give all of us? And Jesus is saying this to his disciples, it is like a small group of people who are committed to God. But I would argue that like this isn't just about that. Even people who you know who are outside of your circle, you can pray for them too. That's okay. Yeah, I'm giving you freedom. Like, pray for other people. Um, and if you're asking God to provide for them what they would need, man, like God is growing your heart in that way. When, when we say, give us, Lord, provide for these other needs too. Provide for them. And then give us today. This is a quote from that um, John Henry commentary that I read. We could as well go a day without meat as without prayer. My wife's a vegetarian, so just um, scratch it out and put like food or like tofu or vegetables or something. 
<laughs> Did you say garlic? <laughs> Was that an Italian that said garlic? <laughs> um, but th there's a, I mean, there's a spiritual practice within the church called fasting where we don't eat and we pray. And if you have ever fasted or just been forced to go a day without food because you had like really good, strong parents who were like, if you don't do your chores, you don't eat, <laughs> like, um, then you know that like when you don't eat, your body aches. It, it, it pangs because there are, there's food that I need. There's a sustenance that I need that I do not have. And like, I need to get that. How, how do I get that? Um, and, and just like your body pangs and hurts when it doesn't have the nutrition that it needs each day, like prayer is the same thing, that there's a sustenance. And when you do not pray, you are starving yourself. You're really missing out on the, on the food, on the sustenance that, that God wants to give you. And we're just, we were saying earlier that like, I want to interact with God every day. I want to be with him every day. I want him to provide for me today. Because, I don't know, there, there are some teachers or like some, maybe your boss, or I'm trying to think of a good relationship where you only actually want to see them once a week or like once a month or something. You're like, if I could see them as little as possible, that would be great. But that's not God. That's not who God is. He's a loving father. He's a caring person who I can talk to, who I can go to, who is king over everything. And it should, we should be terrified of him, but he made himself a man so that we could relate to him and we could we could speak to him. We could under, he would understand our struggles. And, and I want to be around him every day. And if I don't want to be around him every day, then I shouldn't even bother like worshiping. Like, why would I want to worship someone that I don't even want to interact with daily? Like, if I get tired of him, then I don't even know if my heart really longs for him. I don't know if my heart wants to worship him. Jesus is the bread of life. This is it. This is it, folks. Jesus says this prayer, pointing back to the past, saying, remember how our ancestors were provided for miraculously through manna? Do you remember that? Let's pray that God would give us that bread. And then a little later in John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. That bread that we prayed for, that we were looking for provision, that, ex that is exactly who Jesus is. And in John chapter 6, it is such a, there's so many awesome things going on in John chapter 6. Like, I encourage you, like, just read it. Um, I mean, you should read whatever you feel like you should, God is calling you to, but like, man, chapter 6, like, it starts with the feeding of the 5,000, which if you were ever in Sunday school, you probably heard it a million times because like it's a cool story and there's the little kid who gives like, you know, the loaves and the fish. And so it's like, yeah, little kids, like God loves them. And, and, and then all of a sudden he multiplies it and feeds 5,000 people with just a, a tiny little lunch for a kid. And everyone eats and then Jesus goes away to be alone to pray and then his disciples sail across the sea. And so then the next day, the people come to look for Jesus again. And they see that his disciples departed, and they're like, well, we didn't see Jesus go with his disciples, so where did, where did he go? Um, the secret is that he walked across the sea later. <laughs> but they sailed across the sea to go find him. And when they found him, they're like, Jesus, where did you go? Like, we were confused how did you get here? And Jesus kind of, kind of, he like just cuts through it. He's like, look, you came to look for me because I fed you. You came looking for another free meal. But look, look, look for eternal food instead of this food, because you're going to get hungry again when you eat. Instead, look for a food that's going to satisfy you. Believe in the one who God sent you. They, they said, well, how do we do this? He says, believe in the one who God sent you. And he's like, okay, well, yeah, but like God sent Moses and he, he, and he gave manna as a sign that we could trust him. So are you going to give us something too? And, and Jesus is like, no, I, no. Look, 
And he says this in John chapter 6, verses 33 through 35. He says, The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And the people are like, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus, he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. I am the bread that comes down from heaven. And, and they still don't get it. They're like, we know you. We know your parents. You didn't come down from heaven. We know, we know Joseph and Mary. You're not, like, you didn't, like, descend on the clouds. You're just a guy. How can you say that you are the bread of life? And Jesus says, if anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for life, or for the life of the world, is my flesh. And they were already kind of lost before, and they just look at him, uh, what? Your, your flesh? And Jesus says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. If you would understand, if you would really seek to grasp and, and to glean from me, you would abide in me. And his disciples say, this is a tough thing to hear. Who's going to listen to this? And Jesus says, this is what I've told you, that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. And after this, many of his disciples turned back and no, no longer walked with him. And Jesus said, do you want to go away as well? He looked to the twelve disciples and Peter answered him, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed, and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Look, guys, this is, this is it. This is the rub, that Jesus is the provision. When we, when we look at that, he is the bread. He, he is the one that was intended for us. And he does meet our daily need, and he is the giver, and he does draw all people to himself, and he wants it to be today. He, want, he wants it tomorrow and the next day, but he wants it to be today. That's who Jesus is. And he, he loves, and he loves, and he wants to give of himself. He wants to participate in his existence. And we need to think about that. We need to think about what that means. And we're going to take a time to, to ha have responses, have a time of response here. Um, and if you're a, a Christian, I need you to think about, could anyone look at the details of my life and tell that I trust Jesus as the source? If someone on the outside was to observe you and notice how you live and what you do with yourself and what you do with your money and your time, would they be able to say, would there be enough evidence to say, yeah, Jesus is your source. He is your life. And if you're new, if you're a guest, you've got a couple thoughts, but is, is there a part of me that I've been ignoring that hungers and thirsts for Jesus? And you may have had the worst portrait of, of Jesus painted for you. But like, I'm talking about this Jesus. Don't, don't take anyone's opinion. Don't take anyone's view. Like, find it for yourself. Find it for yourself. Encounter him. And is he the part, is, is he part within you that, that you have been hungering, that your, your stomach has hurt, just like when you don't eat, that like it hurts, and you've had this longing. Maybe this is that spiritual sustenance that, that you have been looking for that maybe you didn't realize you were looking for, but, but you're here. And that says something. And also, like, is Jesus even worthy of my affection and dedication? Because people who follow Jesus, they seem to sure love him a lot and give up a whole lot of stuff for him. Is he worthy of that? And I, I just want to... I want to ask you, I want to invite you to, 
to pray, to take this time, to, to seek, to respond, to reflect um, to some of these responses. Take, take this time to be in your own space. Um, you can sit at your chair, you can, you can pray. If, if you need to come up here to these altars, you're more than welcome to. But like, look, we're, we're, we're talking about prayer. We're going through a series in prayer. It would be an insult for us not to take the action to, to actually participate in it. Um, if, if you need to pray with someone, I'll, I'll, I'll be up here. We'll have a few people up here where you can, you can pray. And if you don't know quite what to pray for, if, if you feel like you don't have anything within you that you need to pray for, you can pray for other people, specifically... Um, the Kairos ministry, um, Wayne and our children's pastor, Roy, are, are going into Folsom Prison on Thursday. And they're taking hundreds of cookies with them, uh, which if you're making them, you can turn them into the office this week. But, um, and, and you can pray for them because they're going into a place where people desperately need Jesus. I mean, we desperately need Jesus, but these people, they, they need him. And they're going in as representations, and we can go with them in spirit we would pray with them. Um, so I just want you to look within yourself and see what, see what God is leading you. Pray, reflect. I'll come back up in a few minutes. God, would you lead us to be people who are desperate for your provision, God? Would you lead people, lead us to be people who, who are so brokenhearted that we need you to restore us, God? Would you lead us to be people who are only satisfied in you, God, that the world could give us anything, it could take anything away, God, and, and we would not waver because we know that you are our source and you are our goal. God, would you help us to be faithful and loving and kind, Lord? Would you help us to go into our communities and to do things that we are unable to do on our own? But God, by your Holy Spirit, we can love and we can give generously and we can be kind and forgiving in a way that the rest of the world does not understand. Lord, would, we help, would you help us to be people who look more like your Son? We love you, Lord. We thank you for the gift of your Son and the gift of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Give us courage to not reside in, in our old ways, but God, to move forward and step closer to you, Lord. God, go with us today. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for having been here today. Enjoy your afternoon.